Teaching for Shalom on the Goal of Christian Collegiate Education. Over the past decade and a half, teachers in Christian colleges have spoken a great deal about the need to integrate Christian faith with learning. Here and there, now and then, they have gone beyond talk to produce such learning. In thus urging and practicing integration, they have moved decisively beyond the 19th century paradigm according to which Christianity was to be added on to nuclear, neutral <laughs> secular learning. Integration of faith and learning speaks to the content of Christian higher education, not the goal. Teaching is an engagement between teachers and students, and its goal is always to bring about some change in students, such as an increase in knowledge, understanding, sensitivity, imagination, or commitment. Integrating Christian faith with learning is just a different thing from that sort of personal engagement. To say that Christian scholars must seek to integrate faith with learning is not to specify a goal for Christian teachers. When it comes to goals, it appears to me that we have pretty much been content to accept the educational goals handed on to us by our predecessors. I think it's time to change that. As a counterpart to our thinking anew about the relation of faith to learning, we must think anew about the goal of Christian collegiate education. In this talk, I wish to propose such a goal. To prepare the way, let me identify the most common of the extent goals. Four models of collegiate education. Many of those who work in the Christian colleges operate with what may be called the Christian service model. The idea is that the goal of Christian collegiate education is to train students to enter Christian service understanding this to be a certain range of Christian occupations or kingdom work, evangelism, church education, church ministry, mission field medicine, Christian communications, and the like. Probably in most Christian colleges, there are some educators who think in terms of this model. Probably there are some colleges in which most educators do their thinking in these terms. The popularity of the model, if nothing else, makes it imperative that it be taken seriously and be engaged. I will refrain from doing that on this occasion, however. It regularly happens that even in colleges that begin with this as their dominant model, various dynamics sooner or later set in which cause people to find it too restrictive. As a result, such training colleges regularly transform themselves into liberal arts colleges. Why this shift so often takes place would be interesting to explore, but I think it best on this occasion to spend our time engaging the models that people tend to move on to once they have left behind the Christian service model. Among the most prominent of these alternatives is what may be called the Christian humanist model. Let me spend more time on this alternative than any of the others. Oakshot's Education for Freedom A theme that sounds like a sustained pedal tone in the thought of Christian humanists is freedom. Education is for freedom. Many of those who hold this view simply identify liberal arts education with the humanist model of education and then play on the etymology of the word liberal. Liberal education is education that liberates or frees us. Frees us from what and for what? No more eloquent answer to that question has ever been composed than that of Cambridge political theorist Michael Oakeshott in his long essay entitled Education, the Engagement and its Frustration. Indeed, I judge this to be one of the most profound and articulate essays on education published in the 20th century. And I say this in spite of deep disagreements with this perspective. Oakeshott's theory is not a theory of Christian education, but I propose beginning with him just because he develops more profoundly than anyone else in the contemporary world the theme fundamental in the vision of the Christian humanists, namely, that education liberates us by initiating us into the great cultural heritage of humanity. Oakeshott explicitly grounds his theory of education in a vision of what it is to be human. This, for me, is one of its attractive features. Every theory of education is grounded in a vision of what it is to be human, but usually that foundation is concealed or left unexposed. Not, not so in Oakeshott's case. To be human, says Oakeshott, is to understand the world and oneself to construe the world and oneself in one way or another, or to put the point in yet another way. To be human is to invest the world and oneself with meaning. That is only the beginning, however. To be human is also to respond to reality, thus invested with meaning. To respond in a human way, 
which is different from the animal way of merely behaving. Human beings, says Oakshot, are creatures of want, <coughs> but their wants are not biological impulses or genetic urges. They are imagined satisfactions and are eligible to be wished for, chosen, pursued, procured, approved, or disapproved. To be human is to imagine possibilities in response to one's understanding, to desire some of the possibilities imagined, and then to act on some of those desires. It is to choose to say or to do this rather than that in relation to imagined and wished for outcomes. Each such performance being a disclosure of a man's beliefs about himself and the world and an exploit in self-enactment. This adventure in understanding, imagining, desiring, and enacting that constitutes us as human is not conducted in solitude. Being human is recognizing oneself to be related to others, not as the parts of an organism are related, nor as members of a single, all-inclusive society, but in virtue of participation in multiple understood relationships and in the enjoyment of understood historic languages of feelings, sentiments, imaginings, fancies, desires, recognitions, moral and religious beliefs, <clears throat> intellectual and practical enterprises, customs, conventions, procedures and practices, canons, maxims and principles of conduct, rules which denote obligations and offices which specify duties. <coughs> In sum, a human being is the inhabitant of a world composed not of things, but of meanings. That is, of occurrences in some manner recognized, identified, understood, and responded to in terms of this understanding. It is a world of sentiments and beliefs, and it includes also human artifacts, such as books, pictures, musical compositions, tools, and utensils. For these also are expressions, which have meanings and which require to be understood in order to be used or enjoyed. To be without this understanding is to be not a human being, but a stranger to the human condition. Entering this human heritage of understandings, imaginings, desirings, and enactings requires learning. There is no other way. The educational engagement is necessary because nobody is born a human being, and because the quality of being human is not a latency which becomes an actuality in a process of growth. It is by way of learning, and only by way of learning, that a postulant to the human condition comes to recognize himself as a human being in the only way that is possible, namely by seeing himself in the mirror of an inheritance of human understandings and activities. Thus, Oakshot sees education as that transaction between human beings and postulants to the human condition in which newcomers are initiated into the heritage of human consciousness, thus becoming human. Oakshot recognizes that much of such learning takes place casually, informally, and episodically, but education in the full sense as he sees it begins with a deliberate initiation of a newcomer into a human inheritance of sentiments, beliefs, imaginings, understandings, and activities. It begins when the transaction becomes schooling. Oakshot cites five characteristics of schooling, among them the one at which I have been aiming. Let's have all of them before us. The project of a school is, for one thing, that of a serious and orderly initiation into an intellectual, imaginative, moral, and emotional inheritance. Secondly, School represents an engagement to learn by study, a difficult undertaking calling for effort and discipline. Another element in the concept of a school is that of a personal transaction between a teacher and a learner. The only indispensable equipment of school is teachers. The current emphasis on apparatus of all sorts is almost wholly destructive of school. A teacher is one in whom some part or aspect or passage of this inheritance is alive. He has something of which he is a master to impart, and he has deliberated its worth and the manner in which he is to impart it to a learner whom he knows. He is himself the custodian of that practice in which an inheritance of human understanding survives and is perpetually renewed in being imparted to newcomers. To teach is to bring it about that somehow something of worth intended by a teacher is learned, understood, and remembered by a learner. A fourth mark of a school is that it is an historic community of teachers and learners, 
neither large nor small, with traditions of its own, evoking loyalties, pieties, and affections, devoted to initiating successive generations of newcomers to the human scene into the grandeurs and servitudes of being human. An alma mater, who remembers with pride or indulgence and is remembered with gratitude. In my summary of Oakshot's marks of a school, I have skipped over the one that is of principal interest to me here, the third of his list of five. So let's go back to that one. A mark of a school is that of detachment from the immediate local world of the learner, its current concerns, and the direction it gives to, its, to his attention. School is a place apart in which the heir may encounter his moral and intellectual inheritance, not in the terms in which it is being used in the current engagements and occupations of the world outside, where much of it is forgotten, neglected, obscured, vulgarized, or abridged, and where it appears only in scraps and as investments in immediate enterprises, but as an estate entire, unqualified, and unencumbered. School is an emancipation achieved in a continuous redirection of attention. Here, the learner is animated not by the inclinations he brings with him, but by intimations of excellence and aspirations he has never yet dreamed of. Here he may encounter not answers to the loaded questions of life, but questions which have never before occurred to him. Here he may acquire new interests and pursue them uncorrupted by the need for immediate results. Here he may learn to seek satisfaction he had never yet imagined or wished for. In short, education in the full sense, that is, school education, is education for freedom. Authentic education is for liberation and emancipation from the closed-in particularities of one specific historical and social situation into the wide-open possibilities of humanity's understandings, imaginings, and desirings as a whole. The minimal accomplishment of education is that it brings about the humanity of students by initiating them into the realm of meanings that they will inhabit. Its wide, overarching goal is to deliver them from the particularly particularity of their concrete situations into the universal, universality of the human condition. A truly educational engagement, according to Oakshot, is thus both a discipline and a release, and it is the one by virtue of being the other. Its reward is an emancipation from the mere fact of living, from the immediate contingencies of place and time of birth, from the tyranny of the moment, and from the servitude of a merely current condition. Dilemma's Christian Humanism It is this theme of liberation that is central to the Christian humanist model of education. The great benefit of liberal arts education, so it is said over and over, is that it liberates and frees us. Most, if not all, of those involved in Christian education would dissent from the repudiation of human nature that underlies Oakshot's thought, as if they would from his suggestion that all meaning is invested by us in the world rather than by being discovered. But Oakshot's notion of education is aimed at liberating us from the contingent factual particularities of our situation into the wide world of humanity's understandings, imaginings, desirings, and enactings. This has been a prominent theme in the Western world ever since the time of the Renaissance, and Christian educators have sounded the theme as often and as loudly as any. It should be added, for the sake of historical accuracy, that it was not the goal of Renaissance educators to engage all the different ways in which humanity has understood, imagined, desired, and enacted. It was their goal to engage the student primarily with classical antiquity. Only when Romantic nationalism came into the picture did educators begin to say that all humanity has something of worth to teach us. Recall Oakshot's insistence that to become human, our cultural inheritance of understandings, imaginings, desirings, and enactings must itself be understood. The states of mind in which the human condition is to be discerned as recognitions of and responses to the ordeal of consciousness can be entered into only by being themselves understood. To be human is to understand not only our world, but also our heritage of consciousness. Not only do we invest our world with meaning, we also invest our cultural heritage with meaning. It is at this point that we can move beyond humanism in general to speak about Christian humanism. 
The goal of Christian education, as seen by the Christian humanists, is indeed to free students from the particularity by initiating them into a more universal human consciousness. But it's not just that. The Christian humanist holds that it is impossible to interpret our cultural heritage in some generically human way. We can only do so as religious beings, and then as beings of diverse religions. Believers come to understand the world and their heritage, and to invest those of meaning in particular, non-generic ways. Christians do so in one way, Muslims do so in another, and so forth for all other religious believers. This particular element of the Christian humanist vision has never been developed more profoundly than it was by one of my teachers, the esteemed Christian philosopher William Harry Jalema. When Jalema surveyed that vast cultural inheritance into which he, and along with Oakshot, ardently believed the students should be initiated, he did not see just episodic ebb and flow of understandings, imaginings, desirings, and enactings. He saw a grand sweeping pattern. He saw the rise and fall of kingdoms, or cities, as he liked to call them, faith communities, if you will. It was Jalema's view that if you want to understand the fundamental pattern and dynamic of history and culture, then what is most important to attend to is not individuals or even social institutions, but the spiritual kingdoms of which individuals are members and institutions are expressions. In thus interpreting history, Jalema saw himself as standing in the lineage of Augustine, who viewed human life in times as the interaction between the city of God and the city of the world, Civitas Di and Civitas Mundi. Jalema saw these spiritual kingdoms as objective realities. The city of God is not the totality of individual Christians at some particular time, or even at all times. It is an objective spiritual reality of which individual Christians are members. Neither is a particular kingdom a certain totality of individual cultural products. It is that of which the cultural products are an expression. A civitas, a civitas cannot be identified with cultural products, nor with the will to culture, nor with cultural activity. Rather, the civitas lives and is realized therein. It is realized in and by eating and drinking, cobbling and carpentry, work and play, science and education, law and government, love and worship, Nothing human but enters into the city. The civitas is not one or some, nor even all the objects tangible and intangible, which man produces or assimilates, but is a city that is objectified in the producing and assimilating of the cultural objects. Not only is the pattern of history the coming to expression of humanity's kingdoms and the struggling among them, every kingdom in turn has an internal structure. Determinative of every civitas is a worldview, or mind, as Dilemma was fond of calling it. He spoke especially of the mind of pagan antiquity, of the Christian mind, and of the mind of modernity. He did not claim that every citizen of a kingdom has its formative mind as a whole clearly before him or her. His claim was rather that, if we inquire into what it is that makes sense of the way of life of the members of a civitas, we discover that its members operate with certain fundamental assumptions about reality and life. Thus, just as a kingdom comes to expression in the cultural activities of its members, so in turn a kingdom is itself and the expression of a mind. In turn, and here we get to the heart of the matter, the objective mind or worldview of a civitas also has its own internal structure. It too is not just an assemb assemblage, it too has a determinative center. Every human being, according to Jalema, is forced to give some answer to the question of who God is. Some answer in such a way that they misidentify or misdescribe God. Others may be so far mistaken that they identify something other than God as God. Nonetheless, everyone must give an answer, mistaken or not. The answer one gives shapes the mind with which one thinks, and this mind in turn determines one's particular way of being in the world. Or to state the point better, since this is to put it too individualistically, the mind of a civitas is shaped by its answer to the question of who God is, and this in turn shapes its way of being in the world. 
and an individual adopts the mind of a civitas, thereby becoming its member, by accepting its idea of God. Thus, Jalema remarks that the essence of all choices, the essence of moral choice, is religious decision. The civitas chosen is the continuous living expression of a man's religious faith. It is his answer, writ in large letters, to the question, who God is. Education for Jalema was ultimately then always both a manifestation of the life of some religious kingdom and an initiation into that life. Formal education in the schools, he wrote, articulates the meaning and structure of a chosen civitas, also when it professes neutrality, and inseparably in the same process forms, molds, and educates the citizen in the meaning and structure of whichever civitas. Education is by a kingdom and for citizenship in that kingdom. Education is always religious in its import. The situation is not that the Christian educator practices committed education while everyone else practices neutral education. Ultimately, everyone practices committed education. All, all formal education, says Jalema, even such as professes to be neutral, reflects some civitas. That it cannot escape doing so is but a phase of the fact that humankind cannot escape answering the question, who God is, and articulating the answer in life. That is to say, cannot escape religious decision and allegiance to some kingdom. The difference between Christian and non-Christian education is, therefore, not that religious faith is present in the one and not the other. The difference is between the Christian definition of God and a non-Christian definition, and is thus a difference and opposition between kingdoms. The goal of Christian education for Jalema was to initiate the student into the Christian mind. He was fond of saying that the important thing is not so much what one thinks as the mind with which one thinks. Students must be freed from the bondage of thinking with the mind of modernity and led to think with the Christian mind. To accomplish this, the educator must lead students to converse with those across the ages who have thought with the Christian mind. It is important to realize, however, that those who have thought with the Christian mind have not had a monopoly on truth. Accordingly, students in Christian colleges must also be engaged in conversation with historical representatives of alternative minds, from which they can learn and against which they must struggle. I judge that the Christian humanist model of curriculum is one of the perennially attractive models for Christian educators when they move beyond the Christian service model. No one else has developed it with Jalema's profundity, but always the core idea will be there. The curricular goal of Christian collegiate education is to initiate students into the cultural heritage of humanity from a Christian perspective, thus freeing them from their parochialism and partiality. Educating for maturation or socialization. On this occasion, I can give only brief descriptions of the other models of education to be found in our colleges and in society more generally. Oakshot discusses some of these other models under the rubric of attacks on education. Since he has presented the humanist model as the proper understanding of education, those who embrace alternatives are automatically put into the position of being opposed to education. I think this is a mistaken way of looking at the situation. Education is a social practice. And like social practices generally, painting, farming, diplomacy, and so on, the practice endures amid considerable disputes concerning goals and considerable alter alteration of them. Nonetheless, what Oakshot says is insightful. One of the alternatives Oakshot cites enjoys great currency in our society generally, but very little in the Christian colleges. It may be called the maturation model. My term, not Oakshot's. Oakshot's description is so mischievously marvelous that I cannot refrain from quoting part of it. The maturationist holds that for schooling should be substituted an arena of childish self-indulgence from which all that might contain impulse and inclination and turn them into deliberate and knowledgeable choice has been purposely removed, a place where a child may be as rude as his impulses prompt and as busy or as idle as his inclinations suggest. 
There has been no curriculum of study, no orderly progression in learning. Impulse is to be let loose upon an indifferent, di undifferentiated confusion called, alternatively, the seamless robe of learning, or life in all its manifestations. What may be learned is totally unforeseen and a matter of complete indifference. Each child is expected to engage in such individual projects of so-called experimental activity as he feels inclined, to pursue them in his own way and for so long as his inclination to do it lasts. Learning is to be a personal finding out and consequently becomes the incidental ex ex exegesis and imperfectly understood byproduct of discovery. To discover nothing is to be preferred to being told anything. The child is to be shielded from the humiliation, as it is thought, of his own ignorance and of intellectual surprise, and sheltered in the unfrustrating womb of his own inclinations. Teaching is to be confined to hesi hesitant, preferably wordless suggestion. Mechanical devices are to be preferred to teachers who are recognized not as custodians of a deliberate procedure of initiation, but as mute presences, as interior decorators who arrange the furnishings of an environment, and as mechanics to attend to the audiovisual apparatus. Discoveries may become the subjects of free group discussions, or they may be written about in compositions to be esteemed, not on account of their intelligibility, but for their freedom of expression. It does not matter how they are written, so long as they are creative, to stutter independently is a superior accomplishment to that of acquiring the self-discipline of a mother tongue. Seeing and doing are preferred to thinking and understanding. Pictorial representation is preferred to speech or writing. Remembering the nursing mother of learning is despised as a relic of servility. Oakshot adds that it may be doubted whether anything act exactly like this exists even in America. Another model that Oakshot discusses is what he calls, appropriately, the socialization model. He interprets this as coming to the fore with the emergence of nationalism, and as originally intended, intended to make the lower classes well-functioning contributors to the welfare of the nation. Here is some of his description of it. After a brief but not wholly ineffective attempt to extend the opportunity of education to more of those who had not hitherto enjoyed it, this has become the most notable feature of the recent history of European education, the enterprise of substituting socialization for education. By socialization, I mean here an apprenticeship to adult life teaching, training, instructing, imparting knowledge, learning, etc., governed by an extrinsic purpose. The most common version of this alternative is to education has been that which emerged from the efforts of rulers and others to equip the poor to make a more effective contribution to the well-being of the nation, and which has since been elaborated into more or less systematic arrangements for imparting to successive generations the knowledge and the skills required to sustain the enterprises and provide the satisfactions characteristic of a modern industrial and commercial society. The alternative to education, invented for the poor as something instead of virtually nothing, was designed, for the most part by politicians, as an apprenticeship to adult life, which, far from offering a release from the immediacies, the, part the partialities and the abridgments of the local and contemporary world of the learner, reproduced this world in its already familiar terms and provided the learner with more information about what was already within his reach and with skills in which he was reckoned to be interested, because he was already aware of them in use or in his own talents. The engagement was not to initiate him into a difficult and unfamiliar inheritance of human understandings and his sentiments, but to give him a somewhat firmer grasp of what he recognized to be relevant to himself as he was and to the facts of life. He was not to be put in any way of understanding himself in a new context or of undergoing a, a paling a palingenesis in which he acquired a more ample identity, he was merely to provo provoke to see himself more clearly in the mirror of his current world. Those who promoted this alternative education believed that its products would be more useful members of society. I think there can be little doubt that this socialization model has gained a good deal of currency in the Christian colleges, no doubt especially among those who teach in professional and pre-professional programs. Indeed, the Christian service model, of which I spoke first, is, a, is really a version of this model. 
a version that focuses on a rather narrow set of occupations for which students are to be trained. Educating for Academic Discipline I judge that we are still missing one of the most prominent models of Christian education we found in our colleges. In addition to the Christian humanist model and the socialization model, of which the Christian service model is a species, there is what may be called the academic discipline model. On this model, the goal of education is to introduce students to the academic disciplines, thereby putting them in touch with reality to the extent and the way that theory does that. Doing so, let it, let it be immediately added in Christian perspective. While those who favor the Christian humanist model characteristically defend their choice by stressing the importance of developing in a student a Christian mind, able to engage in discourse with other minds, those who favor the Christian academic discipline model tend to defend their preference by appealing to the cultural mandate given to humanity at creation. Oakshot briefly mentions the academic discipline model of education and treats it as beginning roughly with Francis Bacon. He says, in the doctrine of Bacon and his near contemporaries, Comenius, Hartlib, Milton, et al., education stands not for a transaction between the generations of human beings in which the newcomer is initiated into an inheritance of human understandings, sentiments, imaginings, etc., but for release from all this in which the student acquires objective knowledge of the workings of a natural world. Elsewhere, Oakshaw explains that knowledge, so that explains that knowledge, so the doctrine ran, derives solely from the experience of observation of things, and it represents the empire of man over things. This depiction of the origins of the academic discipline model seems me to me incomplete and misleading. The idea that the goal of the university is to introduce students to the sciences, Scientia Weissenschaften, is much older than Bacon. It was a dominant model in the medieval European universities, and as such, it was the most venerable post-antiquity model of education that we have in the West, more, more venerable even than the human, humanist model. We now have before us a dominant curricular models to be found today in those colleges that present themselves as Christian colleges. No doubt, the Christian humanist model appeals especially to those teaching in the humanities, the academic discipline model to those teaching in the natural and social sciences, and the socialization model to those engaged in professional and pre-professional education. But each model has an appeal that goes well beyond its home base. A Shalom Model for Collegiate Education I have come to think that each of these models is deficient. Let me forego an analysis of what I find lacking in each of them separately in order to concentrate on what seems to me especially deficient in all of them together. None of these models responds adequately to the wounds of humanity, in particular, the moral wounds. None gives adequate answer to our cries and tears. The academic discipline model reminds us that the cultural mandate requires us to develop the potentials of creation by bringing forth science and art. But what about our liberation mandate to free the captives? The Christian humanist model stresses that we must be freed from our cultural particularities in order to participate as Christians in the great cultural conversation of humanity. But what about those who lack the strength to converse because they have no food in their stomach? The Christian socialization model emphasizes that we must train our students to work as Christians within their occupational callings. But what about those people who, after searching long and hard to find, find no occupation? Our traditional model speaks scarcely at all of injustice in the world, scarcely at all of our calling to mercy and justice. I submit that the curriculum of Christian college must open itself up to humanity's wounds. Let me say immediately that this is not a call to abolish the teaching of the humanities, or of the natural and social sciences, or a professional education. It is not a call for a curricular model that is different from those canvassed in that it is constricted in yet a different direction from those. It is a call for a more comprehensive model, a model that incorporates the arts, the sciences, the professions, and yes, the worship and piety of humanity, along with humanity's wounds, and brings them together into one coherent whole, rather than setting them at loggerheads with each other. What might such a model be? What should be the overall goal of Christian collegiate education? There is in the Bible a vision of what it is that God wants for God's human creatures. 
a vision of what constitutes human flourishing and of our appointed destiny. The vision is not that of disembodied individual contemplation of God, thus it is not the vision of heaven, if that is what one takes heaven to be. It is the vision of shalom, a vision first articulated in the poetic and prophetic literature of the Old Testament, but prominent in the New Testament as well under the rubric of Elrin, peace. There can be no shalom without justice. Justice is the ground floor of shalom. In shalom, each person enjoys justice, enjoys his or her rights. If persons do not enjoy and possess what is due them, if the rightful claims on others are not acknowledged by those others, then shalom is absent. Shalom goes beyond justice, however. Shalom incorporates right relationships in general, whether or not those are required by justice. Right relationships to God, to one's fellow human beings, to nature, and to oneself. The shalom community is not merely the just community, but it is the responsible community in which God's laws for our multifaceted existence are obeyed. It is more even than that. We may all have acted justly and responsibly, and yet shalom may be missing, for the community may be lacking delight. A nation may be living in justice and peace with all its neighbors, while its members are still miserable in their poverty. Shalom is the antithesis of this. Shalom incorporates delight in one's relationships. To dwell in shalom is to find delight in living rightly before God, to find delight in living rightly in one's physical surroundings, to find delight in living rightly with one's fellow human beings, to find delight even in living rightly with oneself. What is your and my relation to this appointed human destiny of shalom? What is our relation to the vision of the just and responsible community of delight? The biblical witness is clear. The vision of shalom comes to us for one thing, as a two-part command. We are to pray and struggle for the release of the captives, and we are to pray and struggle for release of the enriching potentials of God's creation. We live under both a liberation mandate and a cultural mandate, and the vision comes to us as a two-part invitation. We are invited to celebrate such manifestations of shalom as appear in our world, and invited to mourn shalom's shortfall. Now for the last link. Can Christian college do anything else than guide its endeavors by this vision of shalom? If God's call to all humanity is to be liberators and developers, celebrators and mourners, and if to that call of God the Church of Jesus Christ replies with a resonant yes, then will not the Christian college have to find its place within this great commission? Of course, a college is not a political action organization, or an architectural firm, or a mission board. It is a school. And it is as a school that the lure of shalom will direct and energize it. But given that understanding, the curricular model that I propose for, a Christ, for Christian collegiate education is what I shall call the shalom model. The goal for which Christian educators are to teach is that our students be agents and celebrators of shalom, petitioners and mourners. Curricular Implications of Shalom Will the curriculum aimed at shalom teach the sciences? That depends on whether the knowledge of reality achieved by the sciences contributes to that mode of flourishing which the Bible calls shalom. No doubt it does. We are created to find fulfillment in knowledge of God and of God's world. Will the curriculum aimed at shalom teach the arts? That depends on whether knowledge and practice of the arts contributes to that mode of flourishing which is shalom. Assuredly it does. Without art, life limps. Will the curriculum aimed at Shalom teach history? Will it teach about per Periclean Athens and 13th century Paris? That depends on whether historical knowledge contributes to that mode of human flourishing, which is Shalom. I cannot escape the conviction that it does. Where our knowledge of what it was to be human in other times and places is diminished, there our own humanity is diminished. Will the curriculum aimed at Shalom Cultivate piety and teach lit liturgy? That depends on whether such cultivation and such learning contributed to that mode of human flourishing, which is shalom. Without a doubt, they do. Shalom is incomplete without participation in the disciplines of piety and, and the liturgy of the church. Will a curriculum aimed at shalom teach for justice? Will it present to its students the injustice and the deprivation of the world? 
Will it teach them to recognize those? Will it ask what, if anything, can be done about those wounds? Will it ask what should be done about them? Will it teach for liberation? It cannot escape the conviction that it will. So I do not propose the abolition of the teaching of humanity's history. I do not propose the abolition of the teaching of humanity's art. I do not propose the abolition of the teaching of humanity's sciences. I do not propose the abolition of teaching of various occupational practices. I propose that the moral wounds of the world also find a place in our curricula, and that we ask how we ought to respond to such wounds. I propose that we adopt a shalom model for our curricula. When I say that the moral wounds of the world must find a place in our curricula, what I mean is not just that we must teach about justice, though we must. I mean that we must teach for justice, for graduate, the graduate whom we seek to produce must be one who practices justice. How do we do that is a thick and complex matter that I cannot get into here. It will have to be the topic for some other occasion. Instead, I want to address in conclusion one of the many objections to my proposal. One objection to teaching for justice is that it will politicize the college, alienating it from its community and introducing conflict into the faculty. Given my own advocacy for justice for the Palestinians, I have sometimes pointedly been asked whether I think we should try to turn all our students into advocates of the right of the Palestinians to their own state. The thinly veiled point of the question, of course, is that anyone can foresee the calamitous consequences of doing that. Note how curious this anxious question appears when seen in the context of what Christian educators do generally. Nobody thinks it is illicit for a professor of philosophy to ind indicate to students his conviction that Thomas Reed's philosophy is superior to David Hume's. Nobody thinks it is illicit for a professor of music to indicate to her students her conviction that Beethoven's music is superior to Boccherini's. But if someone defends the rights of the Palestinians in some course, then suddenly a plaintive the plea for objectivity breaks out. It is important to distinguish college policy from the practice of individual faculty members. No college should adopt as institutional policy that Beethoven is to be taught as superior to Boccherini as a composer or read as a period of Hume as a philosopher. But we cannot leave the matter at the point of distinguishing college policy from individual practice, comfortable as that would be. For though scripture does not present God as preferring Beethoven to Boccherini or read to Hume, it does say that the cries of the poor, of the oppressed, and of the victimized touch God's heart. And it does indicate that the groans of God's created but now polluted earth bring tears to God's eyes. We are touching here not on issues of taste or judgment, but on issues of right teaching, of orthodoxy. We are touching on our understanding of the nature of God. If a college is to commit itself to serving the God of the Bible, it must commit itself as an academic institution to serve the cause of justice in the world. I find no detour around this conclusion. The God who asked Christians to go into all the world to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ is the very same God who loves justice. So we can and should discuss among each other effective and sensitive ways of teaching for justice. We can and should discuss among other effective ways of opening up our students to the wounds of the world. We can and should discuss among each other effective and sensitive ways of handling the controversies that will arise when we teach for justice. But the God whom believers acknowledge in their lives and celebrate in their worship ask that we teach for justice in shalom. For that, God is the God revealed in Jesus Christ, the Prince of Shalom. The graduate who prays and struggles for the incursion of justice and shalom into our glorious but fallen world, celebrating his presence and mourning his absence, that is the graduate the Christian college must seek to produce.